From the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, this is Human Centered. Today we'll hear a conversation between John Markoff and statistician Susan Holmes. Holmes was a CASBIS Fellow in 2017, and she focused on the issues of reproducibility when using modern statistics and the complexities involved with using heterogeneous data types. We'll hear her thoughts on the problem with p-values, the importance of messy data sets, and her research on the human microbiome. I wanted to start by asking about your intersection point with CASBIS. I mean, you're, you're sort of nominally within the biological sciences. You were spending time here in a center of social sciences. Is there a point of intersection? Yeah. Well, the intersection is my interest in uh, the teaching the general public about statistics and data science. So the intersection was educational. But also, I've written several papers about political science data, and so I had an intersection with the social sciences already. Yeah. Uh, it's just that, and the type of data that I analyze, which has to do with how bacteria interact, um, they actually uh, the same techniques from a statistical viewpoint as when we study Facebook networks or Twitter networks. The social network, it's a social network of bi- bacterial communities, but... You know, from, from from my abstract viewpoint, it's the same. But that sort of takes me, I mean, it's not, so what was the, the phrase about lies, damn lies, and statistics? Yeah. But you, I saw in your conversation with Mike Gattani that you had talked about your um, skepticism about what are known as p-values. Right. And I was wondering first, because this is a lay audience, if we could explain what the p-value was and talk about the reliance of on that technique and what's wrong with that. I mean, right. sort of as a walk into... So, 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 so all social sciences um, still require uh, statistical analyses to publish p-values, and they are the what people see it is um, a measure of uncertainty, and we have this hypothesis testing set up, and if the probability of the data under a certain hypothesis is very small. You say the p-value is smaller than 5%. That's an arbitrary number that was set in the 1920s by R.A. Fisher. And that number has now become like the absolute norm for publishing any kind of sociology result or um, psychology. And of course, that gave rise to, especially with computers, the ability to hack the system. That is, you can test many, many times and then hide that you tested thousands of times and get the one result. and uh, Which people routinely do. Yes, yeah. right, right. And so although in 1920s when R.A. Fisher was doing it, a p-value of 5% corresponded in general to work over a 20-year period where you had a one year out of 20 in which you got a result. And so it was a very long-term thing, and he, he was studying crops, and he considered that, you know, if it was a one-in-20-year event, then it was special. And this is very different than being able to run it <laughs> 50,000 times in an hour. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm a failed social sciences, uh, yeah. scientist. When I was studying social sciences, you could collect survey data and you could perform statistics on it. Yeah. What seems to have changed in my sort of observation of the social sciences now is now it's not just survey data. You can collect census data and you can yeah. get this real-time behavioral data. So you get a lot more data. Right. From your view as a statistician, has that improved the quality of social science or are they still relying on the same? No, no, no. It has improved enormously because you can capture multivariate, what we call multivariate phenomena. So phenomena where the perspective, you can measure all the uh, context by many, many variables. And uh, so uh, it's much richer data. 
Uh, and so you, you can capture high resolution, subtle effects. And so I think that, of course, it's improved social science. I see the work that some of the people are doing, even with Twitter or, you know, the, you can follow things which are real. Yeah. It's just what I would say is the p-value is wrong because it's trying to summarize this huge complexity with one number. And I'm into this multivariate where you have multiple things you're measuring. And I just want people to say, make a lot of plots, visualizations, look at your data, but don't think that one number is going to summarize uh, complex phenomena. It won't. Well, we, we, I mean, I believe in graphics, so I like to make what we call principal components or various kinds of dimension reduction. So you can go from measuring 10,000 features on a population to looking at a graphic in three dimensions or two dimensions with dimension reduction. So we know how to do that with um, uncertainty quantification, so you get scatter point clouds and you have contours and even in you know New York Times or any kind of newspaper people are getting much better at doing that and it's becoming much more standard to say okay you have a map we're looking at a map of some contagion map or something people you have the spatial information but you have color for one variable and you might have size of the so you can capture multivariate so with the technology that we have but also because the public has become much more educated and the problem is the infrastructure of the standard publication in the academic literature hasn't followed that is it's not so easy uh, to evaluate the uncertainty. It requires people to make judgment calls. And it's like doctors. They, doctors don't like to be told, oh, there's a score and it's on a spectrum from two to seven. They want to know uh, one protocol or the other. Which one? Where's the, where's the cutoff point? I Don't tell me, you know, just tell me yes, no, because I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, hesitating and so that's why sort of heading down a path to your work in biological biostatistics um, I saw that it, you were interviewed on, at Stanford at a conference and said you really enjoyed working for big messy data sets yeah. I mean it wasn't so much big data it was you like messy data sets yeah yeah, yeah. so 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 I don't like this uh, restriction that people have said oh you know now everything has changed because we have big data as a statistician if you have um, hundreds of millions of records but the records are homogeneous you have absolutely no problem working with them you just take subsamples and you can make very good inferences by taking many many different subsamples I think the big challenges that we are facing have much more to do with heterogeneity that is that you're measuring many many different types of um, different variables. So I'll take the example on cancer. We, You could take a biopsy and you have an image um, and you also have all kinds of measurements to do with the immune system. Then you have the measurements of what genes are expressed, what proteins are made. And so you have maybe 12 different types of data, but you don't have 10 million people on which you're doing the measurement. Maybe you have 10. And so the huge uh, challenge is not... Big variable, not big data. Yeah, that's right. It's the features. It's the numbers of variables and the heterogeneity of the variables. That is, the amount of uncertainty on one measurement is very different from on the other measurements. So you don't know which ones are going to give you the information. But you don't want to let anything go. So you want to combine. And I, I also saw that you spent a lot of time looking... or doing research related to the microbiome. Uh, yes. Yeah. And did, did you, first question is, did you cry, have you crossed paths with an astrophysicist who's the guy who runs uh, UCSD's um, oh, a laboratory there? His name is Larry Smarr. He's gotten a lot of visibility for sequencing his own microbiome. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, there are lots of people, who, and then Mike Snyder at oh, Stanford. Oh, yes, he's the other he, example, he, he, yeah. yeah. We, we call that the narcissism, because you <laughs> only do one person, right? You do everything, all the data about one person. So you're measuring everything about one person, and the question is whether you can infer, you know, it does give you something. I mean, if... If you measure things about yourself and you learn things about yourself, it's definitely a sample of size one. Yeah. And, but and as a statistician, I would say, you know, that doesn't mean anything. But the person who got the Nobel Prize for Helicobacter, he did the experiment on himself, Marshall. 
And uh, he gave himself, hello, go back to, and gave himself an ulcer. Oh, my God. And, and, but proved, yeah. and he gives a talk called N equals one. So, you know, there are pro, there's progress on personalized medicine working on, but that's not what I work on. I, I work on groups of people. I do, I do studies with David Relman, and we work on the effects of antibiotics on different people. And so what does antibiotics do to you if you take it once, but what does it ha- do to you if you take it several times? Oh, um, and so that, that's, that, I mean, that's the microbiome. There are now um, at least two or three companies that are um, doing 23andMe-likes consumer services for the microbiome. And my wife talked me into one of them. And so I have had my microbiome sequenced. I have to admit that I haven't really spent the time to look at what came back. She changed her whole diet as a result of that. But I, do you think that it's, we're... Uh, is that, well, is it we, premature it's interesting to... as a as a scientist. I love this because what happens is it used to be really hard to recruit participants to st- to studies, and uh, when we got in touch with the quantified self group um, in San Francisco, we were able to find pa- more than enough study uh, participants for our study, where we asked the participants to do colonoscopies and take antibiotics twice. And there were many volunteers who wanted to do that. And in exchange, we give them their data. Wow. And, but, 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 and it's yeah. very interesting data. And we needed a large pool of different people because we're not interested just in one. In, a lot about the microbiome depends on not only what you eat, but also where did you go? Where have you traveled? Um, how is your immune system? It's very dependent on a lot of um, other factors than just what you eat. So, what is your current research? Do you have? Is, is... It's all about the methods for the microbiome. So, I'm trying to. I've had a lot of success by realizing that um, when we analyze documents, we do topic analysis. We can find different topics in a in a document, and what's really important is to say a document can have several different topics. And um, taking documents on the web of different lengths, we can still say these are the topics. And, and I've been using those methods for understanding the communities in the microbiota. And so what happens is different strains are like different words, but you can have an overall meaning of the sentence, which is the same in these three different sentences. And they're using synonymous words. And this is the big challenge in the microbiome is the strain to strain variation between people is very high. That is, the biggest source of variability in the microbiota is the subject-to-subject variability. So it's very hard to say, okay, um, this illness is associated to this strain going up or down. It's not one strain, one illness, but it's one topic on one community which is present or not, which is characteristic of a situation. And so you have these strange, which are synonymous. And so I use a lot of topic analysis in the microbiome to understand. And the, 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 the difficulty, of course, the challenge in all of my work has always been the communication problem. It's not the an- analytics or the math. It's communicating to the biologists. It's quite complex hierarchical models. So they're Bayesian hierarchical models. And then, but they're the same ones that work for language. And if you, you talked a little bit about region, uh, geographic region, so that sort of takes you into uh, the, the, the social realm. I right. mean, uh, I guess it could also be uh, working class versus upper class and how diet varies or something. Yeah, but it's not actually working class, upper class. What we see, the biggest changes in the studies I've been involved in, and I work with people who work on the Indian microbiome and all over the world, the Hasda and all different um, studies we've done, it's the urbanization That is that it's not economically exactly. It's the change from um, the very old cultures, hunter-gatherer, classical farmers, um, and then all the way to urbanization. So we see a big change with urbanization. Is that a spectrum of health? Well, I mean, the microbiota, as measured by diversity, yes. That is, is much, much more diverse. And if you took one variable, people always ask me, what's one variable? I would say that you know, in the work, the, one of my collaborators at Stanford is called Justin Sonnenberg, and he's written a lot of interesting papers and a book about this, but it's fiber. Ah. 
yeah. we we don't we don't eat enough fiber anymore. Yeah. And so of course we talk about sugar. Sugar is bad, and you know they're all. Uh, but the the if you you know the the going back to the more traditional societies, there were huge amounts of fiber in the diet, which have been completely lost. Yeah. So, artichokes are good, and yeah. broccoli, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting and, and difficult because, as you were saying, the socioeconomic fact, there are all kinds of things involved. And uh, and it's not only the gut. So I work a lot on preterm birth and pregnancy, and we use that from a vaginal microbiome. And there um, we do see that, you know, there are certain uh, bacteria which are very protective. And lactobacillus, for instance, are uh, very protective. And uh, so you can predict preterm birth um, by looking at swabs from the vaginal microbiome. So it's very used as a biomarker as well, but it's not causal. We don't know anything about causality. Uh, and, okay. And, and then there's also all of this work about um, things like personality and intelligence and, you know, the, the microbiome was being a factor in all of these sort of very high level uh, well, people behavioral... talk a lot about the gut um, brain axis. And it is true that in all the constituents, chemical ones that we use for our brain come from directly from our gut. That is, you know, it's absorbed and it goes directly into the bloodstream and it goes, you know, the, the, there's a definite... Um, that, I just saw a very interesting talk about that uh, axis which had to do with the keto diet. So my son does a keto diet and there are lots of people who do this. Yeah. And that came actually from studies of people who had epilepsy. And they found that if they did a specific diet... Um, the keto diet, very, very severe, um, the, 50% of the people benefited hugely, practically down to no having no um, bits or anything. And so they're understanding, there's, there you have it, there you have the brain uh, gut access right there. And um, a personal, uh, no, I have celiac disease, and the, my only manifestations, apart from lacking vitamins and all kinds of things, was, um, uh, you know, 45 years of headaches. And so this is wheat, right? Isn't that yeah, saying, it's and wheat. so you gave and up the, wheat? And... And, and the doctor didn't know, and I was on all of these medication for migraines because they and then I stopped, and it was... So I know about the gut. <laughs> brain access is really something which is there. It has to do with inflammation. So overall inflammation, when you know, have a reaction against something, it depends, you know, the inflammation can go anywhere. But the brain is definitely one of the places. So um, that's... Um, uh, so N size one, you only believe about it. <laughs> Even as a statistician, I believe much more about that than about anything else. What was your path to statistics? How did you find your way to this um, world? I was a, a mathematician by training. I was in a PhD program for mathematics, and I was very interested in geometry, and I liked the computer, and I wanted to use the computer. And the chair of the math department said, we will never have a computer in this building. You have to go and change your subject and go. The statisticians have access to these mainframes. At the time, we're still in the world of cards, right? But the statisticians use them all the time, so you have to change. And so I changed. Uh, and I didn't know anything about probability or statistics, uh, but I uh, went to see somebody who... Uh, you know, would take me on as a, a PhD advisee, and he gave me a whole stack of books to read over, and and I thought didn't make any sense as a mathematician. Statistics doesn't make any sense because it's a, a, a an approximate science and mathematics is very precise. So statisticians accept to be wrong some of the time, and we just try to be useful in a context. So it's very much about decision making and very little about actually mathematics, although the tools that we use, geometry in particular, um, are very mathematical. So you're completely taught computers. Did you teach yourself UCSD Pascal? You must have. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and what was your first language? Uh, Fortran. Yeah, so so in school, I, uh, we, uh, the only formal class I ever had was uh, Fortran. And all the Unix I learned 
Um, I learned it the same way Don Knuth says he learned his, which was there was a computer game on Multics, on Multics, yeah. and this, you know, you go into a cave. The Wumpus or um, yeah, 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 uh, what yeah. was the other one? Um, there was NetHack and yeah. uh, all the first those good... <laughs> text-based adventure games. And what was funny was in France, we had access to a terminal called, uh, it was a very funny thing, the French government, to go with your phone, you could have something called the Minitel. Yeah. which was a little screen which you could open up. And so when I first visited Stanford, I could email the secretary or anybody on campus to try and find housing from my house, which they found amazing because, you know, this is 1988. <laughs> well, 88, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and so, you know, I could set it all up by email from home, which nobody had. You didn't grow up in France, did you? Uh, well, I, the first 10, year, uh, first 10 years I was in England. I see. I see. And, and then afterwards, I, I did all my schooling in France. And did you come from a scientific or engineering family background or what? No. So, so, so the, the, what happened was my father was a, a doctor and he sent my sister and I to a, a school for young ladies. That is, we learned embroidery and knitting and all that kind of um, thing that only young ladies learn. And then he had a midlife crisis uh, when he was about 40 or so and decided to become a farmer in the south of France. So we moved to the south of France, and I hated it. I didn't like the... And so I was about uh, 12, I guess, and I decided to work very, very hard in school. And I had no academic background, but I you know, had all of this knitting, which was very useful for computer uh, stuff because it's the same. You know, you have to be very patient. <laughs> But but then I did learn, I, you know, I was very motivated not to be a farmer. So uh, I, uh, intellectual, I saw this as a way out. He wasn't growing wine. He was farming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. right, yeah, right. Yeah, he so, was farming. Yeah. He, was, he had. But I, getting up at five in the morning to milk, you know, goats was just not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Where in the south of France were you? I have it was near Montpellier. It was in the Seven. So it was the area where all the people who dropped out in 68 went and this was 70 71 and they you know there was this whole dropout culture so it was completely empty there were no, all the houses were empty because all the people who were farmers had gone back to the city where you could have hot water and bathrooms and things like that and so there were all these empty villages and he bought up one and did he stay was he romantically he, attached? he gave up on the farm and then he did pottery which for a surgeon is probably a good transition yeah. And um, so was, um, don't, I've forgotten his first name, Solomon, head of the statistics department still when you arrived? or did he? No, he was a retired uh, emerita. I knew him. When I first visited, he was active, but he was one of the people who created the department. But there were quite a lot of uh, people. So Brad Efron um, at one point was chair, and then um, Jerry Friedman. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. So Jerry's the person I met um, who had first invited me to give a course. And Jerry was very much in favor of the French um, exploratory data analysis school, which was like John Tukey's. And Jerry was originally a physicist, and he'd come to statistics through John Tukey. And John had spent a, a year at the center, and he was also interested in social science problems as well. John Tukey was definitely a, you know, a, a very influential figure here. Tukey and then Shannon as well. Yeah. And, and I saw that you had a real interest in Shannon. And right. did you Was that a, um, um, a research interest of yours? What, it's a what? book I'm writing on uh, oh, code breaking and pattern searching. And I'd found out that Shannon had spent a year here in between when he was at the labs and when he was afterwards uh, moved to MIT. He spent a sort of hinge year here and I wanted to look at all the papers that had to do with Shannon and I remember looking up I went down to the library to find out you know you have to write a proposal of what you would like to study and he was interested in studying um, psychology so that he could try and make uh, more intelligent computers so he was interested in AI. Ah, did you did you find where his Shannon's that's that would have been super early right? 1957. 
So right during the summer study period when they were yeah. coining the term. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Okay. So, 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 so. He, he wasn't at the meeting, though. He, Shannon didn't participate in that. No, but he, he was one of the people who really was pushing for that. But it, afterwards, I looked at some of the letters and some of the things he wrote, and he was very, very disappointed with his interaction with the psychologists. He didn't feel that they knew anything that would help him make in, uh, computers more intelligent. And so, you know, the level of knowledge, uh, you know, he was hoping that all this interaction with the psychologist would push forward his uh, goal of uh, intelligence. Was he, was he right or was he just sort of really no, on his no, own? No, no, I think he was right at that time. Yeah. I, I think that there weren't ways of thinking it was a uh, co- cognitive psychology at the time was, uh, I won't say quite, you know, just so stories, but there, there, it didn't, there wasn't an analytic understanding of, for instance, of layers or of, you know, it was very, very uh, black box. Uh, and still Freud and, and Freud and et al. were still well, very... Well, and lots of scenarios, but not useful in a, from a pragmatic viewpoint and not very much experimental yeah. uh, evidence yet. And where did you stumble, stumble across the intersection between Shannon and Turing? Well, the, 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 that comes from the war. So, so, so what I was very interested in it was, um, so Alan Turing and Jack Good, who, Jack Good, who's much less known, but he's a statistician who's a hero for people like me. Um, he's a Bayesian statistician. So Turing had a notion of quantity of information and a measurement of how you weigh evidence. And that was done in log base 10, and it was called the ban and the deciban. And that was Bayesian, the, based on Bayesian statistics. And Shannon had something extremely similar, which later became called the bit, which was log base 2 and which was a measure of weighing evidence and measuring information. Oh, for channel, for, for look, characterizing channels, that yep. communication channels. Right, right, right. That, that but, was what... I mean, Shannon did the work in, this, in uh, language for crypto, and Turing did the work in crypto. It, they both came from the same uh, code-breaking background, and it, it was just the way they quantified it. Now, Turing was not allowed to publish so his work became published about five years ago, but Shannon published straight after the war. And I wanted to know whether they'd met. And did you find out? Yeah, and they, they did. met, but they weren't allowed to talk about code breaking. They were allowed to talk about speech recognition. And they were allowed to, because that's what they were both working on as well. That was their sort of in the front what they were working on. So they were allowed to talk about that, but I wanted to know, they met during the war, so they met, I think, 42, 43, and um, Turing spent um, uh, more than three months in Princeton at the time, in New Jersey, and so I'd met for lunch uh, at the cafeteria uh, quite often, uh, Shannon, and they talked. Now, so was that... Was that um prior art for the perceptron and deep learning and it was, is if you were going to trace the intellectual heritage of that you know pattern recognition approach to well it, i mean there's no uh, dis, how can i say the quantification of information uh, is a first step before you start seeing that you have to have a layered system, and the perceptron was slightly after that already. But Turing was definitely somebody who um, many, many people have read uh, various uh, articles that he had about how you could make computers intelligent. And so both, compu- both Turing and Shannon were very preoccupied with that. Yeah. And uh, the algorithms or the things that they developed were, they were based on these, how do you increase the amount of information that the computer understands? Really quick, before we go, can we get an update on, well, first, what is the code breaking book and when can we expect to set our eyes upon it? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So the book on code breaking came from a course I teach at Stanford called um, Breaking Codes and Finding Patterns 
which is very much about my work, uh, both in biology and in code breaking during the war. And we're not, uh, I've been doing a lot of teaching. So I taught pre-med students. I teach a lot of biologists how to analyze their data. And I've been very occupied with finishing the book for biologists. And now I've finished it, I've come back to the code breaking book. So the book is not finished yet so we but we hope another year or so it's okay it's all about the war so nothing has changed <laughs> <laughs> more information comes up but uh, this is great thank you, thank you. Okay. that was fun okay <laughs> thank you john yeah yeah thanks again to stanford statistician susan holmes to learn more about her work be sure to check out the links to her personal site in the episode notes Human Centered is a show from the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Special thanks this episode to Barbie Mayhawk. To learn more about the center, visit our website, casbs.stanford.edu, or find us at Twitter, at Casbis Stanford. Thanks for listening.